and uh, everybody kind of has things on their smartphone, but I'll tell you, it's a blessing to hear the Word of God being opened and the pages parted. Uh, and if you would, let's turn in our Bible to Jeremiah chapter number 10. We're continuing on in our study of the Word of God. We broke last week, obviously, because we had a missionary to Israel. Wasn't that a blessing to uh, have a missionary going to God's own people? Reminds me that uh, just because uh, Israel is in an apostate condition, God still cares about His people. God still has a plan, ultimately, for future Israel. But Jeremiah chapter number 10, let's stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. We've read down through verses 1 through 16, and uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 17. In verse 17, Jeremiah the prophet under inspiration says, Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will distress them that they may find it so. Woe is me for my hurt, my wound is grievous. But I said, Truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the brood is come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in a man that walketh to direct his, self, his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. You may be seated. May God add to the reading of his holy inspired word. Tonight I want to preach on the simple subject, eviction notice. Brother, this is the wrong one. Eviction notice. I, I hope you've never seen anything like that on your door, and uh, I trust and pray you don't see anything like that in the near future. But you know what that means whenever you see an eviction sign or eviction notice on someone's door. It means you're about to be kicked out. It means you're about to be cast out of your dwelling place, and that is exactly what God is doing here uh, with Israel in this, these passages. And so that's why we've entitled the message this, this way. And uh, let me just start off by trying to bring it to where we are. But how many of you know what is meant by the phrase, tough love? Anybody? We've sort of lost some of that in this generation, but tough love is an express expression used when someone treats another person sternly by enforcing certain constraints upon one whose actions and behavior are wrong are wrong and destructive with the intent to help that person in the long run. Tough love never is motivated by uh, the short term. It's by the long term. If you study the Bible, what you discover is that, for example, in the book of Jeremiah, that our God is an advocate of tough love. Our God is an advocate of tough love. What I mean by that is God cares so much about the long-term welfare of a person or a people that he is willing to administer the harsh consequences of their sin for ongoing rebellion upon them in the present, though it may be severe. And he does that with a long-term view of helping them in the future. God is a God of tough love. Now, when we speak on the subject of tough love, isn't it true that we usually think only of the hard road the person receiving the tough love will experience? 
We begin to have empathy and sympathy for that person. Our heart goes out to that person. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But one of our shortcomings is that we fail to stop and consider that it's often more painful for the person who is administering the tough love than for the one upon which the tough love falls. For example, I, I know personally of a father who is absolutely heartbroken right now because he's had to exercise tough love upon his adult son in time past who was living a riotous life. Now, the father had given him every chance to repent and live by the rules of his home, but he was uh, given certain rules after he kept breaking the rules. He was told he could not have his worldly friends over. He was told he could not treat his home like a hotel and just check in when he wanted to and have no accountability. He was told he could not continue to live his partying lifestyle and live under that roof. And guess what? The son agreed to all the rules... But then he broke the rules as time passed over and over and over again. And the father patiently kept warning him again and again. He said, son, if you keep this up, I'm going to have to kick you out. I I don't want to, but you're going to leave me no choice. You're going to force my hand if you don't straighten up and abide by my rules. Sometimes there will be a little bit of change from what I've heard but that would only last for a few weeks or days, and then the son would inevitably go back to his old ways. And so one day when the son came home, he found that his father had went into his room, packed up all his belongings, and put them outside. And naturally, when his son arrived home, he was shocked, but his father had told him that he had been warning and warning and warning that this day would come. Now, I want to tell you, on that day, that father was heartbroken. He was devastated. He was full of sorrow because he loved his son. In fact, he was putting him out because he loved him so much. You see, he knew that if his son was ever going to turn around from his destructive path, from his defiant behavior, if it was ever going to be changed, this all needed to happen. This was tough love. Well, what we have going on here in these verses is a very similar situation. While we're not dealing with a father and a son, per se, we are dealing with a situation very similar because God loves the nation Judah, the nation Israel, for that matter. Judah was the remnant of that nation. And there are many parallels here that I can point to to show you how this was tough love, but it was necessary. The people of Judah refused to repent of their sin, and they refused to abide according to his covenantal rules and laws in his land. But my Bible tells me that we shouldn't think that God was unloving. They were actually the apple of his eye. In fact, if you look at verse number 11, look with me in verse number 11. Look back. Remember what we read last week? Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these. I'm sorry. I'm in, I'm in the wrong place. Verse 6. Let's see. Hold on. Let me find my place. Verse 16. I'm sorry. Verse 16. The portion of Jacob is not like them. For he is the former of all things. The portion of Jacob Jacob's not like who? The heathen, the pagans. What's their inheritance? Well, they worship false gods. That's vanity. That's pointless. What's their portion? Death, destruction, hell, that's their portion. But the portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former. He's the maker of all things. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. What we find here is that According to the Word of God, God was saying, I'm your inheritance. What greater inheritance can a person have than for the living God to be his Lord, to be his Savior, to be his Father, to have the mercies of God applied to you and his promises given to you? That's greater than any human relationship or worldly pleasure. That's greater than any earthly riches. 
Only a fool, only one that's brutish, as we read of in verse number 8, would trade the true and living God and his ways. Verse 10, he's the true and living God and all of his mercies for the things of this world which are perishing. Verse 11, the things that are perishing and passing away. Sadly, Judah had become a foolish and brutish people. And it wasn't because God had not been good to them. God had planted his people in his land. He had provided for them and had protected them and had nurtured them. He only asked that they love him alone. Have no other gods before him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. He only asked that they love him and obey him out of that love. And initially, when he made the covenant with the people, they said, we will. We'll obey, we'll obey, we'll abide by the covenant, but over time, they proved to be a rebellious and unfaithful people. And they systematically broke all of God's covenants over and our commandments over and over again and kept disobeying Him for generations after generations. And also, they gave their love and affection to other gods. Now, because God is loving and patient. I mean, God suffers long. God is long-suffering because He is long-suffering and He is loving. He didn't kick them out of the land immediately after they had clearly violated their covenant, and He had been just in doing so. Instead, He extended mercy and grace upon grace by sending them. He had raised up His messengers, and He had sent them time and time again. He raised up His prophets to preach to the people and, and warned them to repent and return to Him in faith and in love and obedience before He had to serve judgment. Yet the people took God's love for granted. They abused His grace and mercy. They ignored his warnings despite living in the land he created for them to worship. They forget that was his land. He's the land Lord, literally. They refused to serve him and worship him. They thought to themselves, we're God's people. We're saved. We've been delivered from Egypt. We've been given this place. No way he'll ever kick us out of this land. We visit his house occasionally. We go there on the feast days. We give him offerings from time to time, sometimes lavish offerings. Sure, uh, we praise his name, and we speak of him in the highways and byways and say, the Lord liveth. And we're free at the same time to live as we please. We can praise him on the feast days and still hold our idols. And so now God sends another prophet by the name of Jeremiah, in essence, with an eviction notice. And he says, that's it. Pack it up. You're going, you're moving out. You're not moving on up, you're moving on out. You're not living here any longer. Verse 17, look with me. Gather up thy wares. Gather your things, your belongings. Out of the land, O inhabitants of the fortress. He compares Israel to a fortress, not in the sense that it's fortified and can withstand anything, but in the sense that it's under siege. It's surrounded. And so we see, first of all, the casting out of the people. As Jeremiah wraps up his temple message, his temple message that God called him to deliver is, is coming to a close. As he winds down the message, he begins to shock his hearers, first of all, with this instruction, which is basically, get your things together, grab your bags, and start packing. God is sending you packing. You're going into exile. You're going to be refugees. The day you've been warned of but continually scoffed at, the day you thought would never come, it's here. It's here. This command had to be jolting. One author writes this, Suddenly there is the sheer drop from the pinnacle to the depths. From the thought of Israel as God's own treasure, God's inheritance, to the pathetic sight of her as, as a refugee, leaving the ruins for the road. Now, Jeremiah, by inspiration, is looking into the near future and seems to be, in his mind, he's fast forward and riding in the middle of the Babylonian siege, perhaps whenever Jerusalem was literally surrounded by Babylon in 597 B.C. And he's preparing the people of God for deportation. 
Now, archaeologists have told us that paintings and engravings from ancient times in the Near East, they depict whenever a people were conquered, he would depict long processions of captives, or that those paintings and pictures would depict uh, long processions of captives being led into exile, and often they were shackled together at the ankle, and each prisoner would be carrying whatever possessions they could garner or gather together, and they'd wrap those things in a bundle and then place them on their head. And so that's what would happen. That's what Jeremiah is seeing when he says, get your stuff together. There's no time to lose. And understand that it is God who is evicting you. It is God who is serving you tough love. Verse 18, for thus saith the Lord, behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once. Now, I can imagine as Jeremiah's preaching this sermon, I mean, there's a lot of people coming, uh, probably some high feast day, and they're assembling there in, in the temple, and they're pouring in. I can imagine whenever he's beginning to tell them to pack their bags because they're leaving, they probably look at Jeremiah and say, you're a crazy old fool. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever, preacher. We aren't going anywhere. This is our land. This is our home. And so God makes it real clear. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once. God warns that their judgment of eviction will be forceful, sudden, and violent. The word translated sling out is actually the same word for slingshot. In other words, God says, in effect, it doesn't matter what you think, what you say at this point, I'm going to catapult this people out of this land into captivity, and it's going to happen just like that. Now, this may seem harsh on the surface, but keeping in mind that God is the one who said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That was what God said. God is the one who has been patient with Judah. God is the one who had been faithful to the relationship. God is the one who has kept sending prophets and, and sending messages of mercy, of repentance and restoration. And I assure you that this was painful to the heart of God to have to execute this tough love. But it was necessary for the welfare of the nation long term. So what was God's intent with this coming siege, this coming deportation? What was God's intent with this hard consequence of casting the people out of the land? Look at verse 18 again at the end of it. For thus saith the Lord, behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will, here's why I'm doing this, and will distress, I'll trouble them that they may find it also. We see, secondly, the chastening of the people. God says, I'm going to distress them. I'm going to trouble these people. Literally, I'm going to devastate these people. You know, there's pleasure in sin for a season, <laughs> but when God serves notice, I'm going to tell you, the distress and the trouble will be experienced. Well, he says he's going to do it so, look at this, that they might find it so. Now, that phrase could also be translated that they may find feel it, that they may feel it. In other words, I'm going to cast them out of the land that they may feel it. What do you mean by that? Simply, God is saying that the people would finally feel. A lot of times it looks like sinners are getting away with sin, and they're enjoying their sin, and they're living comfortably in their sin. But God is saying that at some point, if they don't repent, they're going to finally feel and experience directly what they refuse to believe. He's going to make sure of it. The people of Judah have been told over and over that sin is going to bring devastating consequences. I mean, the, the prophets of the Old Testament have been preaching faithfully and warning. They've been told that rebellion against God will bring judgment. They've been told that idolatry would be their ruin. They've been told that if they refused to repent of sin and obey God, that he would chasten the nation with severe consequences. 
But you know what happens whenever people hear messages like that? You know, I remember when I was young, and I'd hear my grandpa preach messages, fiery messages on sin. And you know what happens when you're in sin? At first you tremble, and you walk outside, and you just kind of make sure lightning's not about to strike. Isn't that true? You ride home, and you wonder if you're going to be in a car wreck. And then a little time passes, and you're like, oh, hmm, I'm okay. And time begins to deceive us. As if, well, you know what, I, I'll get away with this. God's, God's not going to do anything. God's merciful. God's gracious. And time deceives us. Our heart is deceitful. The people would not believe the messages of God's coming judgment. They dismissed the warnings. They despised the preachers who were trying to help them. And instead of heeding the truth and repenting, you know what they did? They persisted in their sin, and they thought the comforts and blessings they were enjoying in the land, they just continued to enjoy Life will just go on as before. That's what they're going to think. Life's going to be like in the days of Noah the second time, right, when the Lord comes. What they did not realize was the fact that just because they hadn't experienced immediate judgment up to this point, what they were actually experiencing was a limited space of grace, a space of repentance. But now that space of repentance had expired. And the Lord said He was going to make them feel the ruin, the misery, the distress, the trouble of what they had brought upon themselves that they might find it so, that they might believe that God is true and He tells the truth. We're no exception to His Word. They were going to find Proverbs 13 to be true, which says, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. But he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. I'm going to tell you, though, the road of a sinner, the road of rebellion against God, the road of disobedience, that is a hard road. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. In that same chapter, God goes on to say, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now, that's pretty strong. We live in a day where we don't like uh, correction in any, on any level. But God says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes or early. He's not passive. He, he deals with his children when they're in disobedient. When they're in disobedience, he deals with them diligently. In God's chastening of the nation Judah, God was proving his faithful covenantal love for the people. You see, I, I want to continually stress this. God has a future plan for Israel. And so, out of love, he chastened the nation betimes, often diligently, time and time again. Why? That he might preserve a remnant out of it, lest the whole nation be lost and ruined forever. Let me tell you something. You say, well, na uh, the nation of Israel is apostate right now. Yes, they are. And that's why there's going to be a tribulation period. The Bible talks about the tribulation period, and one of the titles that's given is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob. God's not done with Israel. And guess what? When God gets done with the tribulation period, or with Israel in the tribulation period, uh, you read Romans chapter number 11, all Israel shall be saved. But this eviction and captivity was necessary that he might bring a remnant of his people back to the land 70 years beyond this attack or this assault. And I want to tell you something. We haven't got there, but let me just tell you up front. When the children of Israel came back, that remnant came back from the Babylonian captivity, they were done with worshiping pagan idols. You don't read any more of pagan idols in the temple. In fact, they revolted against anybody that tried to bring idols. They were done. Listen, God, God had a way of purging the idols. Parent, let me ask you a question. What do you do when your child continually rebels and disobeys? 
I mean, after you warn and warn and warn. Let me tell you something. If you do not chasten them, you will only embolden their poor behavior. And I want to tell you something. You might think this is loving and friendly or whatever. This is hatred in the sight of God. Really, it's loving you more than loving that child because you don't want to deal with it. You don't want to put yourself, I don't want them to be upset with me or I don't want to deal with the stress. That's loving yourself and hating the child. To love a child means that you will establish boundaries and rule that protect them. And when they near those lines or cross them, you must warn and execute discipline lest you ruin that child. Chastening is necessary. A child left to himself, the Bible says, will bring his mother to shame. I saw that when I was on vacation as clear as day. We saw a uh, a little boy yelling at his mom, and his mom was telling him to come on. They were leaving, and he was yelling and yelling, and I don't know whether the guy was the dad or what, but he went to try to get the little boy, and the little boy threw a punch at him, and a little later at his mom. And the boy was probably 12 years old or something. I'll tell you, I wanted to beat that child myself. I really did. I, when he threw, his punch at, threw a punch at his mother, I said, oh, no, it's all I can do to contain myself. They're going to call the law on me. It was, it was a mockery, but I, I could see parents who probably tried to just try to talk and downplay things and say, no, no, that's bad. Take time out. Take a deep breath instead of wearing that little backside out. And his mother was being brought to shame in public. It wasn't the child that I, I, I thought bad of. I thought bad of the parents. The parents made that mess. The child doesn't know any better. That's the way he's been allowed to, to uh, let that sin nature manifest itself. Sad whenever parents discount the Word of God when the Bible tells us how essential chastening is. And while we know that on the parental level, why do we despise it in the Christian life? Chastening is necessary. I'll say more about that. But I want to I be honest. That's the only way many of us ever learn to obey or learn to believe what we're told will happen if we persist in sin. Isn't that true? Once again, we find that Jeremiah, he, now let me be honest, Jeremiah didn't enjoy preaching this message. <laughs> he enjoyed serving the Lord, but preaching this message was hard. But to be true to God, he had to faithfully preach to the people who he knew after delivering the message are going to hate him for it. And to be true to God, he with integrity delivers what God says, but at the same time on the inside, he's lamenting. He's wailing, he's weeping over the horrors of their coming siege and exile. Let me tell you something. A true man of God, though he reproves and rebukes, and he stands up and proclaims what thus saith the word of God, and he warns, and he cries aloud, and he spares not. He takes no joy in it. The only pleasure is in standing and being faithful and true to God. There's no joy in saying that the wages of sin is death. The joy is when people hearken and heed the truth and get right with God. And Jeremiah was brokenhearted as he had to preach this message. Look at verse 19. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said truly, this is a grief and I must bear it. My tabernacle, my my tent is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains, for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Let me touch thirdly on the calamity of the prophet. Jeremiah has already sworn absolute solidarity with his people back in chapter 8 where we read these words, For the herd of the daughter of my people am I hurt. Here's a man with compassion as he sees the hurt and the turmoil in the people and what's coming. He feels it in his heart. 
Here we find him crushed again in chapter 10 as he considers God's eviction of his own people. And he cries out, Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous, but I said, Truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. God's judgment against the nation is not just some cold sermon he's preaching. This has come down, been brought down to a personal level that is afflicting his own soul. Being a righteous prophet of God, Jeremiah accepted the fact that he must endure his people suffering as his own. Remember in a previous read, we saw how Jeremiah said, at times, I just want to leave and never look back. I wish I could go to a deserted place, a barren place, a wilderness, and, and just hang out in a ho- hotel with wayfaring and sojourning men. <laughs> It'd be a lot easier. But he knows that he must endure his people suffering as his own as he labors for God among them. Now, understand that though he is, though this is deeply personal to him, He's not just speaking for himself alone. The the nation's represented here, and this would be their cry as well. What he says, and the reason I say that, what he says in verse 20 about his sons doesn't fit his personal circumstances because, as we're going to find out, in chapter 16, Jeremiah was commanded not to marry or have children. But Jeremiah identified so closely with the people of God that it's hard to know where their sufferings ended and his began. Now, in what ways did Jeremiah suffer through this judgment upon his people? Look back at verse number 19. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous, but I said, truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. Let me say, first of all, he suffered physically. The plight of his people produced a grievous wound in him physically. The language here indicates that Jeremiah's own body was Racked, and I don't know to, with by what, but I do know his body was racked with illness from the anguish he carried. How many of you know that great sorrow can destroy you physically? What a reminder that the life of faith which seeks to know the heart of God and do the will of God and serve God, and many times right there on the front lines rescuing souls. Let me tell you, that life is not always a life of health and wealth and happiness. Even though he was righteous, Jeremiah was afflicted with an incurable wound. No doubt he was crushed emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. To some degree, it damaged his own health. In verse 20, he suffered in another way. He says, my tabernacle, my tent. Many people in that day didn't have. But listen, the wealthy had houses made of stone. Common men had tents. My tabernacle is spoiled. And all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. Let me say, secondly, he suffered domestically. You know, a lot of times we think, well, when God pours out His judgment, that we, as God's people, go unscathed. That's not the case. How many of you know when God executes judgment on someone in your family, you feel the pain of it too? When God judges a nation, let me tell you, the people also, the the righteous people, they don't go unscathed and untouched. They suffer to some degree as well. Jeremiah would not live in a bubble. He would not be isolated or insulated when Babylon came and conquered Judah, his own household would be destroyed. Jeremiah describes how that he, just as his countrymen, would have the ropes of his tent cut by the enemies. I can just imagine. That might be how God saved him. Can you imagine the tent collapsing in on Jeremiah, falling down on top of him? Worst of all, the invaders would snatch the children. He refers to them as his son. They're his countrymen. Snatch the children of his people and carry them away. One moment you're hearing children playing in the fields and the streets. The next minute you're hearing nothing but cries and screams in the distance. In the aftermath of the invasion, he would be, the prophet of God would be homeless. And there would be none to help him set up his tent again, he says. What a heartbreaking scene. He suffers in another way, verse 21, for the pastors are become brutish. And have not sought the Lord, therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. 
Thirdly, Jeremiah suffered socially. Jeremiah suffered because the leaders of his nation were foolish. Let me tell you, when you have foolish leaders, you'll suffer socially too. His leaders were immoral. They refused to seek the Lord. Now, the leaders, the shepherds in that day, he could be referring to the ancient priests or the political leaders as the shepherds of the people. But the shepherds of the people, these leaders, were to gather, protect, and feed their sheep, the people. But these shepherds were brutish like animals. They followed after their sensual appetites. They didn't seek after the Lord and follow his laws. Jeremiah may have had in his mind whenever he penned this passage kings like Manasseh or Jehoiakim who deliberately rejected the Lord God. Or perhaps he was thinking of the false priests and the prophets, the many false prophets of Israel who denied that God would judge his people for their sins. Remember, they're, pre- they're preaching peace, peace, when there is no peace. They're, pe- they're preaching that God will just uh, turn his eye to your sin, and you can continue on serving your idols and living any old way. Most likely, he was referring to both the royal and the religious leadership of the nation. But Jeremiah felt great internal anguish because the leaders of his nation and his church were ungodly, spiritually ignorant, and immoral men. Let me say when shepherds, and I'm making the application to to the church, when shepherds are ungodly, immoral, do not seek after the Lord, and do not shepherd the flock according to God's word, the people will be scattered. They'll turn blindly to their own ways, which will prove to be paths of destruction. Christians, we need to pay attention right here and recognize that Jeremiah's calling to ministry did not deliver him from suffering. It destined him for it. Friends, I want to tell you, Jeremiah's sufferings were or are not unfamiliar to those who truly follow after Christ in a world that hates him as they watch those around them ignore God, ignore their altar calls or their words of Scripture and admonitions and continue to pursue sin, as they look around and watch their society decline. If you genuinely follow wholeheartedly the Lord Jesus Christ, then you too will be men and women of sorrow, just as our Lord and Savior was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You cannot live in a fallen world and watch people plagued with sin. You cannot watch them go that way be destroyed by sin, and not be touched with sorrow and acquainted with grief if you have the heart of God. Yes, we have joy. Yes, we have hope. But in this world, we also have tribulation. We also groan with all of creation, awaiting the redemption and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live with a continual wound, a grievous wound for others which we must bear. We must bear that we might make a difference. And some have compassion making a difference. That wound, let me tell you something, it will only intensify as the reality. As we study this book, that wound should only intensify as the reality of God's coming judgment increases in our own understanding. Look at verse 22. Behold, the noise of the brood has come. And a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Next, we see the commotion of the plunderers. Jeremiah could hear in his spirit the great army of invaders charging towards them. And he hears them thundering through the land with great noise and commotion and destroying everything in their paths. The land will be barren after this attack, and it will be pillaged. It will be desolate. The only sounds will be that of wild beasts, like that of jackals howling in the desolate streets. Such an understanding of what was ahead would cause most people to become fatalist. <laughs> a lot of people would see, if they saw a vision like that of what was coming, perhaps even for our country, would become fatalist, literally. A fatalist gives up on life. A fatalist lives without hope. A fatalist does not trust that God is good and can work all things together for the good of those who love him. 
or that life has any meaning at all. But I want to tell you, Jeremiah was no fatalist. He was a man of faith. (laughs) And in such times, when you see the desolation that's coming, when you see the destruction ahead. What do you do if you're a person of faith? I'll tell you what you do. You fall upon and rest upon the sovereign providence of Almighty God. Look at verse 23. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. This is a confession of providence. Jeremiah begins his closing prayer. He's closing the sermon, and he's praying. In his closing prayer, he throws himself upon God's divine providence. Let me tell you, things don't just happen. How many know that God has a way of orchestrating all things? And the prophet admits that a person's life cannot be considered his own as though he is totally and absolutely free to direct his own steps. Oh, Lord, he says, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct himself. He's, he can't do it apart from your wisdom, but at the same time, you are in control of his steps. Jeremiah understood the truth of Proverbs 16 and verse number 9 that says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. We can make all the plans we want, but let me tell you something. God will direct the path. Jeremiah did not know in detail how was all of this going to play out for the country. Jeremiah didn't even know how it was all going to play out for himself. I tell you, that would be troubling to see all this coming, (laughs) knowing you live here. At the same time, he didn't know how the promises of God, there were future promises given to the nation of Israel. How could they be fulfilled? But let me tell you something, why he didn't know how all those things were going to work out, he trusted that God was in control. Is it not often the case that we begin to see how God has directed our footsteps most clearly as we look back over our shoulders? It's then as we look back to the past that we begin to see the pattern of our footprints behind us along the trail. Every Christian can testify how God has guided his or her footsteps to faith in Christ. You weren't just where you were when God dealt with your heart. It wasn't by chance uh, there was a song or there was a preacher or there was a track. It wasn't just by chance you were where you were. You look back over your shoulder and you realize how God directed your path. You're not sitting here by accident tonight. Oh, it's my choice. Oh, let me tell you something. God has given you a choice. Yes, he has, but God has providentially arranged it for you to be here. God directed your footsteps. God directs our footsteps. And God's the one who arranged for me to meet my spouse, no doubt. God's the one who ordained that I would have this calling in my life. This are not mishaps. And Jeremiah trusted that God was guiding his footsteps too. And for that matter, even when it seemed he might even be consumed in all this, he trusted that God knew what he was doing. He knew that even, if, even when it came to Israel, why it looked like Judah might be destroyed through all this, God's in control of this. He recognized that his physical, domestic, and even social troubles were under God's control. In, in the words of that great Puritan writer, Matthew Henry, the prophet here acknowledges the sovereignty and dominion of the divine providence that by it and not by their own will and wisdom, the affairs both of nations and particular persons are directed and determined. Because God was in control, directing the prophet's steps and even the nation's path, even in judgment, Jeremiah makes his request to the one who is Lord over all. Verse 24, O Lord, correct me. Let me ask you, when's the last time one of your children came up to you and said, Uh, Mom or dad, I need you to to chasten me. I need you to whip me. I need you to correct me. Boy, what a heart that truly is hungering and seeking after God and his righteousness. Oh, Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Notice next the compassion in this prayer. 
Now, no doubt there's the personal implication. Jeremiah knows he's no saint, and he knows there's still things in him. Thinking about the judgment that's coming, God, he's saying, God, you need to deal with me and straighten me out. <laughs> you have to deal with me. But at the same time, he's speaking as a representative. There's two levels here, personal and as a representative of Judah. Because Judah's judgment was inevitable, Jeremiah is pleading that it might come only with God's justice, not with his anger. In other words, when he's praying that he would be corrected with judgment for him and his nation, symbolically, he's saying, God, you do what's right. You do what's just to correct us, but not in anger to destroy us. You take whatever is necessary to straighten us up but don't destroy us. Don't consume us. Not in anger. Why? Lest we be reduced to nothing. <laughs> if God deals with us in anger, we're, we're, we're toast. Once again, using the word me, Jeremiah was identifying with representing Judah before God. What a beautiful picture, though, here of intercessory prayer. Isn't that the heart of God? that we see at Calvary as the Lord Jesus makes intercession for sinners. I think we have to do the same for our nation in this day. I think we need to do the same for our church, for our families, for our loved ones. At the same time, ask God to deal with us. Verse 25, pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. Finally, we see the condemnation in his prayer. Finally, Jeremiah asked that God's judgment of Judah be accompanied by his judgment on the pagan nations. Those who have refused to call on God's name. In refusing to call on God's name, they have ultimately devoured and destroyed God's covenant people with their own wickedness. I can somewhat, listen, this is righteous anger. Some people ask, is this sin? No, this is not, in, this is not sin. I'll give you scripture. He's not saying, Lord, I don't want these nations to be saved. He's saying those that are bent on not embracing the God of Judah, but want to take Judah down the path of whoredom and serving other gods, those that are devouring us, God, I pray you would recompense judgment upon them. It's no different than uh, people who say, I wish God would just do something about these drug dealers that are destroying our children. Oh, I wish they'd get saved, but if they're not going to get saved, stop letting them defile and rob and damage and destroy. It's a righteous thing for God to repay tribulation to them which trouble and devour God's people, especially those who ultimately reject Christ. They're, they're not going to get saved. They refuse to. Their only goal was to take as many people as they can to hail down the riotous lifestyle or the pathway as they can. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a willful disobedience of the gospel. They don't want it. They only want to harass the people of God or bring them to their persuasion. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Let me say in closing, there's two things I see in this passage. Number one, that's the love that's given in chastening. When we see passages like this, if we're not careful, we go, ooh, God's awful tough and mean. No, listen, God is loving. God is loving. There, if God had not been dealing with Israel time and time again through all the things through history and the way he had discouraged them, they would have went the way of some of these other nations that are not even in existence. Babylon. When was the last time you met a Babylonian or an Amalekite? These that serve pagan gods and deities. Why is there an Israel today? And all the Perizzites and Jebusites, where, where are they going? Let me tell you, God in mercy, God in love has stayed true. And through his scourging, he has proven his faithfulness. Hebrews 12, 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you is unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, 
nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For the, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endureth chastening, God dealeth you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all, all in the family are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. God has a long, God gives tough love with a long term view in mind. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after when God gets done, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You're no longer at war with God. You're not, no longer in rebellion. There's now peace and harmony. God, I, I submit. I obey the fruit of righteousness. Now you're living right unto them which are exercised thereby. Let me say, finally, we see the love that is given in chastening, but also we see the long-term goal in chastening. Ultimately, God cares about our soul. This body, this flesh is going to the grave. And let me tell you, God chastens his own. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 5 and chapter number 3, Paul said, For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. There was a young man who was involved in gross sin in the church. And Paul says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? Here's the long-term goal. That the spirit may be saved in the, name, in the day of the Lord Jesus. The goal is always repentance and reconciliation and restoration. That's the goal. I remember when I first started preaching and started learning about Church discipline, I despised it. I thought, woo, I don't want no part in that. All I want to do is preach and pray, amen? And I began to study my Bible, and I began to read after great men like Andrew Murray, Shane, and some other great men of God who teach that the Word of God teaches that the man of God, the shepherd, should not only administer doctrine, he should also administer church discipline. And there's a procedure for all of that. But let me tell you something. What's the goal of all that? To drive people away? To make people mad? No. To deal with people. To confront sin. To bring them to Christ. There could be short-term fallout and anger, but ultimately, if the soul is saved and delivered, praise God for it. Why do you discipline your children? Hopefully, it's out of love. The same reason God chastens us. When God chastens you, let me tell you something. I'm going to be preaching a message in the upcoming future. In a new series I've laid out, a lot of people confuse coincidence. Bad luck. I heard a guy say, I got bad karma. They confuse coincidences with God's chastening. Isn't it amazing we talk about how God chastens, but Christians today don't recognize chastening? Isn't that amazing? God don't ever chasten us. So let me tell you something. If you're without chastening, you're bastards and not sons. Are you really a child of God? If you're really a child of God, then you should see God chasing you when you go astray. When you see, God should be chastening you. Let me tell you, sometimes the form of chastening, you might say, I'm having a hard time identifying. We're going to learn about some of that in the upcoming message. But sometime when God just shuts off the joy spout and the peace and the fellowship, that to me is one of the worst forms of chastening I experience. Sometimes I'd rather God just go ahead and take me on out than just cut off the fellowship. And feel like I'm in a prison of darkness and coldness and not feel his presence, not experience his joy and his peace. And I become all ornery and indifferent. I, I tell you, I, I've been in the light. When I'm not in the light, I'll tell you, I'm miserable. I, I've, I've experienced that joy of the Holy Ghost. And when I don't have that joy of the Holy Ghost, I'll tell you, I say, God, what's wrong with me? I know that peace that passes all understanding. And when that's interrupted, I'm telling you something. God chastens his own, but it's for our own good because he loves us to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. When he gets done, whew, it was good that I've been afflicted, but now I keep thy precepts. Amen. I love thy law. I love your fellowship. Thank God for his chastening. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.